Throughout history, men have designed armored vehicles to be used against their enemies on the battlefield. While the first vehicles with the name tank have their roots going back to the World War I, the idea and the concept of the tank goes back all the way to the Middle Ages, where carriages were converted to serve as breakthrough weapons or to transport valuable goods. Some of these carriages would be classed as siege units instead of tanks. That's because of the elements that makes a tank a tank, like its propulsion and firepower, were not yet sufficient in those days. Believe it or not, a V12 twin-turbo diesel engine generating 1500 horsepower was not a thing yet in the 1500s. For example, this carriage would have had a combined horsepower supply of… one. Sad times. Many different designs were transformed into weird-looking shapes, including a design from Leonardo da Vinci, resembling more of a movable TP tent than an actual tank. With a dozen cannons covering all sides, this was less of a tank, more so a movie set piece for Pirates of the Caribbean. More so, an effective reloadable cannon was also not yet invented, with armies mostly using dismountable cannons to be used as artillery. Fast forward a few hundred years, messing around with horses and shitty wooden cars, the first serious design of something resembling a tank came in the year 1915. A British Army colonel named Ernest Swinton and William Hankey championed the idea of an armoured vehicle, with conveyor belt-like tracks over its wheels that break through enemy lines and traverse difficult territory. To keep the project secret from enemies, Production workers were reportedly told the vehicles they were building would be used to carry water on the battlefield. So, the shipment containers were labelled with the name Tank. I guess it is getting a bit obvious now where the name Tank came from. You're welcome. The first Tank prototype was getting the name Little Willy. Yes, a very well-suited name that just shouts out fear, chaos and destruction. Little Willy was slow, broke down easily and was banned in crossing trenches, which was a pretty fundamental issue in World War I. By 1916, Little Willy was followed by Big Willy, which had similar issues. Nevertheless, people saw its potential, so further improvements were made on the design of the Big Willy Mark I. This resulted in the first successful large-scale tank maneuver during the war, with 400 tanks capturing 8,000 German troops and more than 100 field guns. With this successful win, the story of the arms race had begun, with Germany developing a new tank model to counter these threats. The German A7V Sturmpanzerwagen, yes indeed a better name than Little Willy, emerged on the battlefield. Although the vehicle had a better performance record, the Germans failed in getting a high production number that would make a significant difference on the battlefield, a problem the Germans wouldn't really learn from all the way to the end of World War II. Nick Klug during World War I and after, many weird tank designs followed, with the Russian Tsar tank basically a giant reversed wheelchair, which was almost impossible not to spot by enemy units. Also, the enormous wheels would have made it very difficult to shoot any of the guns on targets in front of you. You know, that place where the enemy is 99% of the time? The 1917 American-built Tracklayer Bester wasn't a beauty either. A toppled-over rowing boat with a turret was another weird, faulty design. The vehicle was only used for training maneuvers, and its legacy was short-lived, with the vehicle ending up being used to lead parades being covered in posters, probably displaying the text, how not to build your tank. With the outbreak of World War II, the most prominent tank-producing nations being the UK, Russia, Italy, Japan, Germany and the US joining later in the war, all had very different approaches on their tank designs. The Italian and Japanese tanks were among the worst of the bunch. If you don't agree, yes, you can leave a comment down below. And no, we will of course not read it. Especially during the closing stages of the war. Japanese and Italian underarmored and undergunned tanks stood no chance to the overwhelming numbers of Allied tanks. The Germans did a better job engineering their tanks, but as mentioned earlier in this video, had problems over-engineering their tanks and could not keep up with the mass production. Simpler tanks like the M4 Sherman and the Russian T-34 tank. The tank-producing capabilities of the US and the USSR proved that the Second World War was a numbers game. As long as you were the one capable of easily replacing your losses, your win would be guaranteed. Match fixing to the max. The US-produced M4 Sherman tank was one of the most successful designs of World War II, with many different variants being produced. The tank was fast, easy to drive, easy to maintain, and was easy to replace if the tank was destroyed. Although that last one probably did not comfort the crews a lot. No shame. The USSR designed the ultimate tank of the war, the T-34, and later the T-34-85 hit a staggering production total of more than 84,000 units which is a lot. 
You can make your tank as fancy in design as you want. If you encounter 84,000 enemy tanks, you can probably Barbaros all the way back to where you came from, humiliation style. This does not mean the Russians did not have their fair share of stupid designs. One weird Russian invention, the Antonov A-40, was basically a set of wings with a strap-on tank to pilot the whole thing. In order to keep it flying, it had to be stripped of all this ammunition, so you ended up with a tank with no ammo. Great idea. World War II had more weird tank designs, with some being very successful and others being complete shit. The British converted many tanks to be used for the D-Day landings, naming them Hobart's Funnies. You had an amphibious Sherman DD swimming tank. You had the Crab Sherman, used to bitch slap mines into the air. You had the Crocodile Churchill, to flam cut the Germans out of their bunkers. Another Churchill variant had a 20 kilogram mortar attached to the turret. Again, something unpleasant to be on the receiving end of. The Germans also had their special tank designs, with most of them being far more impractical, mostly because of Hitler's over-the-top mindset. An example of this was the development of the Mouse Tank, a gigantic heavy tank weighing 188 tons and using 16 to 17 liters of fuel for just one kilometer. Luckily for the Germans, they had plenty of fuel to go around by the end of the war. <laughs> that was a joke. They did not. And so, the Maus tank never saw any action and were found mostly blown up by the Germans themselves. If you think the Maus was over the top, say hi to this absolute monster. The Landkreuzer P-1000 the latter, basically a battleship, but then on that. Another crazy drug trip in Hitler fantasy with basically no tactical or military value whatsoever. The P-1000 latter was designed to house naval guns on a giant armored chassis. The project was quickly terminated when they found out the P-1000 latter would be too big of a target to enemy air units, which sounds also like a too big of an understatement to me. During the last phases of the war, the US introduced the Pershing tank, and after the war, the US further developed tanks. The most numerous were the Patton tanks, after which followed the Sheridan tank, many other models, and eventually the tank that is still in use today, the M1 Abrams heavy tanks. They have served in the Gulf War, the war in Afghanistan, the Iraq War, the 2011 Egyptian Revolution, and multiple other theaters of war. The Russians kept producing new T variants, including the T-54 and later the T-72, followed by the T-90, which are doing great in Ukraine right now. A tank that might perform better in Ukraine could be the T-14 Armata, but for some reason the Russian government has not produced significant numbers of the T-14 yet. Basically, why would you want to send capable tanks to Ukraine anyway? Their tactic is to let their tanks be blown up, so their flying capolas become additional artillery to pummel the enemy. Very clever. Maybe in the near future we will see how the German Leopard tanks will perform, or their latest 2022 Panther tanks. By the way, interesting name for a new tank, considering the Germans are always so itchy with everything relating to their past. And yet, they can now just copy-paste Nazi tank names straight from World War II like it's a fucking Call of Duty game. For now, it looks like Ukraine will become more and more the world's largest testing ground for new weapon systems, both for Russia and the West. It might tell us more if the role of the tank will remain significant in the future. Or will it become completely obsolete? Time will tell. Check out our new store for cool Mitzi merch, or join our Patreon community. Every month we publish new and exclusive content. Check out our Patreon and become a member today.